Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. I hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to another amazing Saturday session. Um, I wanted to start um, by just sharing with you, I mean, I think people know, like, every Thursday night we kind of scour the news to see what's happening. There's so much news, obviously, that cannot be covered in uh, Sheikh's Khutbah, but I thought I would share just some headlines that I pulled. You know, usually I, I give him, like, a huge stack of reading. I feel really bad because, you know, I look at this, I'm like, oh, this is important, this is important, this is important. And then usually it kind of gets whittled down to the few things that he does talk about. But I thought I would just share some of the headlines from this week, which were, I thought, really important just to take note of, especially as, you know, we, it's just important to keep uh, abreast of the news. Um, Stockholm Environment Institute says the world is at a boiling point as climate crisis and war rage. It's 19 weeks into the year and America has already seen 198 mass shootings. The Earth's atmospheric CO2 hasn't been this high in millions of years. The racist replacement conspiracy is undergirded by a real resource scarcity. That's from The Intercept. And another one from The Intercept, U.S. demands Russian war uh, crime prosecution while neglecting its own accountability. Clearly, any of these articles would be enough for just one khutbah. Um, but the thing that really dominated yesterday's talk, which of course I have to underscore again, Israeli far-right groups calls for the dismantling of the Dome of the Rock on Jerusalem Day. If you didn't hear the khutbah yesterday, it's important to go back, but even more so just to be aware of this particular headline. This is from Mideast News, and there's a, this um, visual that uh, Sheikh shared yesterday, which is where you see the Dome of the Rock in the background. In the front, you see um, a bulldozer getting ready to take it down. And this is really alarming, obviously. Um, and this is something that is supposedly calling for Israelis to come and start, uh, to come and meet and be part of the dismantling of, of the Dome of the Rock on May 28th, which is before the end of this month. Um, and this just, I mean, sends chills down my spine. Um, and it's, again, like, you know, I would really highly recommend if you didn't see the khutbah to, to watch it um, from yesterday. But it's, it's really interesting because oftentimes, you know, Sheikh will be calling to people and saying, you know, if you're the type of Muslim that feels like this has nothing to do with you or you can't really connect, um, you know, this is a, an, an indicator of our health as an ummah. And I, I have to admit, it's really, um, when I go back and I think about like my early days as a Muslim um, and I would hear about Al-Aqsa Mosque or I'd hear about things like in the Middle East that were really far away from me and that I just felt like I didn't have connection to, it was really hard for me to connect. But what has been really striking for me to reflect on is how my feeling about that has changed over the course, especially in the last year and a half as we've been covering these halakhas. Because when you really start getting engaged in the history, the stories, the connection, the message, everything that we're learning here um, that helps make you feel like this message is really direct and, and personal, um, and then you start understanding even you know historically like, okay, Al-Aqsa Mosque is what, con what connects us you know, at, from, from Mecca to uh, Jerusalem, it connects us to the entire monotheistic faith, to Abraham, you know, um, and how people want to break that connection so that people can just say, oh, see, Islam is just an Arab religion. You, you know, you just feel like, no, you, you know, I, I, when I, now when I look at something like this, I feel like, okay, let's drop everything. We all need to go to Al-Aqsa Mosque and, and fight, even if we lose our lives. And I remember, um, actually, when I first met Sheikh, um, we had the, the Bosnia, we were, you know, in the issue of um, the Bosnian war, and he used to say, I want to go to Bosnia, and I want to fight, and I remember the reaction of Muslims around him that were like, oh my god, I think I should feel that way, but I don't feel that way, and I didn't actually feel that way myself, like, okay, you know, not a great idea, let's not all fly to Bosnia, but I, now I understand that feeling and that passion, and it comes also from, from the, the Quran and everything that we have learned here, and what, what we know, and now it feels like we have a very personal stake in it, so I hope that even at a minimum, obviously, we can't all like fly there and do something, but maybe there's something that we can do. And um, I just, I, you know, at, at a minimum, for people to know that this is on their, um, their plate, this is on their radar, this is something they want to do in a matter of, a, what, a less than two weeks, a week, and you know, today is, what, the 20th? So in eight days, they want to do this on Jerusalem Day. So um, this is, you know, if Muslims need to protest, they need to run out in the streets and do whatever they can. But I don't even know if Muslims are aware that that's, that's what's on their, their radar. Um, the other thing is, um, I thought that, you know, a lot of, um, recently I've been meeting, um, well, I mean, we, through our work, we meet a lot of converts, we meet a lot of heritage Muslims. And so, you know, when, when I start thinking about like, 
that my that my transformation and feeling from convert to to now, especially after the Quran, and then meeting like people who come across our work, whether they're heritage Muslims or whether they're converts. What strikes me, I really start thinking about this convert dynamic because what I've what I've recognized is that converts that I meet have like um, something that is very powerful, and I've tried to put my finger on it, and I think it's a sense of a lack of entitlement. They come at this religion, this faith, with you know a, a completely clean slate. Like they don't, they have you know. Well, we as converts, we have our own baggage. Usually, our baggage is personal. It has to do with how we were raised, our family, our friends, whatever you know. This culture, whatever culture we we grew up in, and so it's its own challenge to try and let go of that baggage. A lot of it is Islamophobic. You know, when we're doing this this you know walk towards um, conversion. For heritage Muslims who want to take this path, it's a different thing. You have a different kind of baggage. And, and a lot comes with entitlement, partly because if you were raised as a Muslim, you feel like you already know what this religion is about. And that is its own challenge, because letting go of things that you know you think are Islam but actually are not Islam. Um, you know, so again, I've said many times, you know, I really invite heritage Muslims to try and take the I, you know, the attitude of a convert, try to let go of everything that you think you know and just you know, leave it at the door and start new. And, and that's hard, it's difficult to do, but that is the first step, I think, to liberation. And I, I wanted to share this really beautiful email that I just received um, from someone who actually um, attended our halakas back in the day, which um, when we were in Los Angeles and um, used to come uh, often. And he had written me um, after we came out with Prophet's Pulpit and you know, said, I'm sorry, I've been so busy, I haven't been able to keep up. But through our um, our email, he, I, I said, you know, I'm really happy that you are, you benefited from from Asuli, and that you know, you you've still kept in touch all these years. So I wanted to share this really beautiful bit that he wrote to me. He said, um, to say that I merely benefited from my time with Asuli would be an understatement and gross miscarriage of justice. I found in your work a vindication of the ethical nature of the religion I always knew had to exist, but that I couldn't find in other Muslim institutions, and sadly, that I probably won't find in other institutions. In fact, because of your work, I literally cannot read a single ayah of the Quran in Arabic without noticing some ethical import, which as I've come to believe is the intent of the Creator. Since Allah, as He Himself says, doesn't play games, nor does He need to play, I'm not sure how it couldn't be otherwise. I would even go so far as to say that I've come to believe that Allah has cleverly hidden himself and his nature within and behind ethics and morality, and that if one fails to in interrogate these dimensions of the deen, they will not find him, regardless of what methods they use, legalism, Sufism, etc. I don't know that I would have arrived so fully at this conclusion without you guys. I did receive my hardcover copy of the Prophet's Pulpit, and it is a gem. I tend to flag all the books I read, and within it are already flags galore. I look forward to the publication of the other volumes, inshallah. I can see in this work the mission of the Usuli Institute manifested in corporal form. As stated above, in relation to my own story, to battle against history, which is indeed our God-given task, is a monumentous, is a momentous endeavor. But of the many lessons one can and should take from the history of struggle of black Americans is that Allah is always capable of the miraculous so long as one retains the vertical vision of the prophets. Um, this, you know, he's a convert and, um, and has, you know, has been following us from early days. And again, so again, that, you know, there's just this spirit that comes with people who are starting on this journey anew and, you know, rediscovering like God and, and this path. And I feel like that's something really special that we try to, um, you know, to convey. And so when I receive a message like this, I feel like I really have to share it because, you know, this is someone who's been with us on this path and for anyone who's starting on this journey with us now, you know, it's important to hear from what people have, you know, have gained over the years in following the work. So I um, just want to really encourage you again, you know, just to, to, you know, let go of baggage, try to start anew. And um, this is a really beautiful, liberating journey. And I certainly testify that everything that I've learned here, you know, after battling to let go of baggage and trying to discover something new, it has been really incredible. And to top it off with, you know, everything we learn here at the Quran is just pure gold. So um, anyway, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I'm really looking forward to another session. And uh, inshallah, um, that's it. <laughs> thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. وسبحان الله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله الميمين وعلى أصحابه المختارين 
وعلى من اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي يا رب العالمين طيب so today إن شاء الله we are talking about سورة الصف Uh, one of the short surahs of the Quran um, that is part of the surah, uh, the musabbihat, the, the surah that begins with uh, either sabbaha lillah or yusabbihu lillah uh, or subhanallah, the, the These two are all have the beginning of tasbih, which, as we said before, is all the ways, whether in action or in speech, um, that Allah's singularity, uniqueness, that Allah cannot be compared to to anything else and is like it is not like anything else Th- this is the idea of tanzih tanzih is all the ways that we recognize or attest to or affirm that all is from God and all is to God. That the ultimate truth and the essential truth and the quintessential truth is God. Okay, so Surah Asaf um Again, it's it's rather interesting because y- you do have a few reports that claim that Surat al-Saf was revealed even, some reports say, in the Mecca period. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, most scholars uh, I recognize that these are not reliable and that in all likelihood Surat al-Saf is a... Um, is a Medinian surah, it was revealed in the Medina period. And we again have reports that claim that Surah Al-Saf was revealed after Surah Al-Taghabun and right before Surah Al-Jum'ah. And if, if these reports are accurate, then Surah Al-Saf would be in order of revelation 109 or 110, something like that. If these reports were accurate or would be believed, then it means that it was revealed after Surah Al-Hadid, after Surah Al-Rahman, after Surah Al-Talaq, after Surah Al-Hash, which we have not talked about. after Surah Al-Nur, after Surah Al-Muntahina. Um, but we confront the same issue that we dealt with with Surah Al-Jum'ah. That if indeed it was revealed after Surah al taghabun then that would make it a late Medina revelation. which for many different reasons is extremely unlikely. Part of the reasons I will mention, some of the reasons, because it would take us just be too extensive um, an endeavor to, to talk about all the reasons why it is indeed unlikely that it is such a late Medina revelation. 
well, and again, we always ask this question, well, does it make a difference? Well, as you will see, yes, it makes a difference in the case of Surah Al-Saf as it did in Surah Al-Jum'ah. Because Surah Al-Jum'ah confronted us with the challenge, like a lot of the, the surah that begins with Tasbih or Tanzihullah, Subhanallah, or Yusabbih Lillah, or so on. They are confronting us with an ultimate challenge, a proof of faith, a challenge that you confront the ultimate existential question as to what your priorities are on this earth and that you make the right decision. And Allah often in the musabbihat in general doesn't tell you that if you make the wrong decision you are no longer a Muslim but you have failed if you make the wrong decision confronted with this sort of existential challenge then you have failed in some fundamental ethical way and as we saw in Surah Al-Jum'ah that when Surah Al-Jum'ah of course you remember that confronted with a very human human uh, scenario um, where you are thinking about scarcity and you are thinking about securing uh, your material interests, you are thinking about uh, pragmatic needs, and you have to make a choice between an obligation that you owe to God and these pragmatic needs and Surah Al-Jum'ah clearly tells us what the right choice is and gets us to think very seriously about the extent of hypocrisy in one's heart if we do not make the right choice. Surah Al-Safad uh, or is of the same genre. Um, and so while we have these reports that tell us that it was revealed after the Taghabun and as I said then that would make it in order of revelation something like 109 or 110 a very late Medina revelation we have a number of cumulative reports that tell us that Surah al -Saf was revealed shortly after the Battle of Uhud. And that, in fact, some reports even say it was revealed in the third year after Hijra or the fourth year after Hijra. Um, so at a, a critical juncture, when a critical formative period. The, if you recall, this is the period now where Hijra has taken place. Medinian society is still challenged by a large number of people who did not convert and is challenged by a considerable number of people who converted nominally say, say they're Muslim, but their loyalties are not with Muhammad and, and his disciples, and also challenged by the existence of a number of Israelite tribes who, although acceded to the constitution of Medina and consented and helped draft the provisions of the constitution of Medina and signed onto them the three Jewish tribes that main tribes lived in Medina but 
there are continuous tensions because of re continued contacts between these Jewish tribes and the enemies of the migrants or the enemies of the Muslims, who the Ansar and the Muhajirin, the, 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 those who are natives to Medina who in fact are loyal to the Prophet and the, the, those who migrated. And there are, if you imagine the, the, the third year or the fourth year, and especially after the Battle of Uhud, which uh, was a defeat, um, there are constant, there's constant news of conspiracies or constant news that a, that makes many of the Muslims feel very unsafe because they they are not sure they can trust the Israelite tribes who if in fact they betray Muslims it will be the end of because they they, they control an area of Medina um, which if the enemies come through these areas, they would literally be invading Medina from behind the lines, so to speak. And so it, it, it would be very difficult logistically to think through we would be able to defend against a betrayal. But news of continuous contacts between the Jewish tribes and the Meccans that they are providing the Meccans with intelligence, that in fact they're helping the Meccans undercut Medinian economy, that they are helping in creating immersion, uh, shortages in Medina, uh, shortages of, of food stuff and shortages in essential material that is needed to um, for weaponry and things like that, and that they're doing this in coordination with Quraysh. And, but, so while the Prophet ﷺ is keen on collecting reports, but at the same time, you have to be constantly careful because Intelligence reports is one thing, but evidence where you can actually prove betrayal and treachery is another thing. So it's an extremely stressful time. And like Surah al Juma, the reaction of the Quran to this very stressful time is to demand that people make a clear choice. They either put God as center and actually foremost in their life, or they hang on to the many pragmatic excuses because if you're looking for excuses, there are many things that you can grasp onto to give yourself an out, to say, well, you know, things are complicated. Well, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that, and so on. And so it makes the reports that say that Surah Tassaf was revealed shortly after Uhud, and in it, it genre wise it makes perfect sense that the revelation of the surah would be in that critical period before the battle of the trench before ghazwat al khandaq which was sort of the culmination of a lot of the tensions as we will see um not after the battle of the trench As the Musabbihat go, 
it makes far less sense for it to be such a late Medinian revelation. But this is the nature of often the, you know, um, the nature of many things in history and the nature of many things related to narratives in the Islamic tradition. If you are looking for a clean uh, narrative that, you know, just tells you a unidimensional story, you're not going to find it. It is part of Allah's challenge. Everything that, uh, that, that has ambiguity is part of Allah's challenge to us to use our intellect and to use our efforts at research in order to come to a considered opinion in order to come to a probability of belief. And while we say that such and such is more likely, but we never act like dictators with the tradition and foreclose the possibility that we might be wrong. So while I do not believe that Surah As-Saf was revealed after a taghabun, I always leave open, always leave open the, the possibility that my mind could be changed if evidence emerges or if people can make a case. Okay. Um, one last thing about order of revelation. Many reports tell us that it was revealed right before Surah al -Juma. That's probably true, uh, that it preceded Surah al -Juma, but it was not after Surah al -Tagabun, in the same way that Surah al -Juma itself was not after Surah al -Tagabun. Uh We've talked about the Taghabun and the message of Surah al -Tagabun, of course. Okay, so a short surah with a very powerful message. سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ هو العزيز الحكيم. So the opening is the message of Tanzih, as we said, and as far as the musabbihat go, the musabbihat, the 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 all derived from the root sabbaha, sabbaha to to recognize the singularity and the oneness. the ways that Allah is equal to nothing and like nothing else. This is, as we said, it's a tanzeeh. The musabbihat, when you look at all of them, you find that they occur in the form of past tense, al-madi, or al-mudara, yusabbih lillah. Sabbah lillah is past. Yusabbih lillah is mudara or a present. And in the form of a command form, Amr. Like when you say, Sabbih Lillah. So, Sabbah Lillah, Yusabbih Lillah, Sabbih Lillah. Sabbih is command form. And as th this has been noted by, uh, by scholars that it is the central theme of Tanzir is not 
subject to time. It's as if Allah, by making it past, present, and a command form, that it is the fact of creation itself. Creation attests to a God, God unlike anything else, beyond the logic of creation. And the fact that it occurs present past and then the command form in various stores when you take them all together it's like saying you can be you can acknowledge yourself as part of the very harmony or the very if you will music of creation that supplicates the singularity of the Lord, or you can choose to be an aberration. Entire creation, in all its forms, in its, all its complexity, engages, is engaged by its very existence in a state of tasbih. Only human beings and jinn have the choice to be an aberration. If you choose to be an aberration, an outlier from what creation is, you choose to, it's as if you choose to walk away from the divine. If you choose to walk away from the divine, you choose to walk away from the light, from the nur. And then, of course, the question is, well, what is behind a nur? If you walk away from the light, what is there? And what I believe is there is only the demonic darkness where Allah is Allah is through Allah's creation is manifested in light everything that drifts away from Allah is a step towards darkness And in darkness, there is only the not comforting or the uncomfortable arms of the demonic, which too many people are content to rush to and be with. Okay. So with this beginning, Muhammad Asa translates it as all that is in the heavens and all that is on earth extols Sabbah, God's limitless glory. For God alone is almighty and truly wise. Then he says in the next verse, in Surah Al-Jum'ah, we are given sort of what the, at the towards the end of the Surah, Allah presents us with the the sort of the the uncomfortable challenge. In Surah Al-Saf, the uncomfortable challenge comes at the very beginning. We're, we're sort of just it right smack into our face. So after just this this declaration of the truth of existence, being in a state of tasbih. Uh, with the, the implied question, are you a part of that existence or are you an aberration to existence? Allah presents us with the immediate challenge of, Ya ladina amanu lima ma la 
those of you who say you believe, who believe that they believe, who believe that they believe, There is, if you will, a painful litmus test. Why is it that you declare your beliefs to be one thing, but your actions are often not consistent with what you say you believe? Now, in the tradition, there are many narratives about precisely what transpires for so around Surah Tasaf. So you read a number of traditions that say that a group of the companions um, were talking and they wanted to ask the Prophet والسلام, what is the most beloved thing for Allah? What, what of all the deeds that human beings can possibly engage in is the, the thing that would bring you closer to Allah? And the narratives tell us that they, for some reason, it doesn't tell us why, but it just tells us that they were hesitating to go and ask the Prophet ﷺ. Was it because they've asked too many questions and, like, you know, they, they knew that they're, they're taxing the patience of the Prophet? Was it, um, it, it doesn't tell us. It just tells us that they were hesitating. And then these reports tell us that Right as they were like talking about, well, should we go ask who should go, who should be the person to go and ask, uh, and so on, that a man came sent by the Prophet saying the Prophet received the revelation and the revelation is Surah to Saf. Interestingly, in these reports, it doesn't, doesn't tell us who the man is doesn't identify the man who came bearing the revelation. When we find a report like this, we are very suspicious because it is very unlikely that a man that is not identified by name would come bearing a revelation from the Prophet so although we look at the chain of transmission and we see that the train of transmission could be sound and is in fact sound, but from our knowledge of the seerah of the Prophet is that he wouldn't give, wouldn't trust someone to convey a revelation who is not named and that it was not the practice of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ not to name because they were quite careful as to who was communicating what when it came to the Quran. But so this is one set of narratives. We have another set of narratives that tell us that around the time that Surah Tasaf is revealed, some narratives tie Surah Tasaf specifically to the Battle of Uhud and say that there were a lot of Muslims who um, would talk about how they are willing to sacrifice for the sake of Islam and that they are, you know, they're eager to sacrifice. And then in the Battle of Uhud, they failed the test and ran away. Um,
again, for, for a variety of reasons, these reports are suspect because we know the, the highly authentic traditions about what was revealed about the Battle of Uhud. And Surah Al-Saf is not among those highly authentic, the, 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 not the highly authentic part is that it relates specifically to the Battle of Uhud. Okay, so then we come to the third bundle of reports. And the third bundle of reports is that after, in, in, around this, the, 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 the same time that we have the revelation of Surah An-Nisa, and we, we remember in Surah An-Nisa that Allah talks about those who, uh, uh, when, لَمَّا كُتِبَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْقِتَالِ that when Allah decreased that you engage in warfare, a number of people basically faltered. They, 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 they found the challenge of actually engaging in warfare to be, but that what eventually emerges is a, a number of people who, as the traditions say, um, يَقُولُونَ ضَرَبْنَا وَطَعَنَّا وَفَعَنَّا That they were, how, how do you, uh, what do you uh, call these people? Uh, there's an English, like people who, who love to brag about their exploits. They say, we did this and we did this and, you know, we, we they're bragging, but they're, in fact, um, they're exaggerating what they've actually done in order to augment their status in society. So they're telling stories, basically. And they're telling stories about how, you know, they sacrificed and they did X, Y, and Z in the Battle of Banu al-Mustalaq, which was after Uhud, uh, or how they bravely, they bravely did this or did that, but they're indeed exaggerating. And so that third bundle of reports tell us that Surah al-Saf was revealed specifically to embarrass these people and say, why is it that you, you, you claim to have done, to do or to have accomplished what you did not accomplish or to have done what you have not done? Perhaps belonging to the same um, group of narratives that Allah revealed Surah Al-Saf as a, a direct response to the braggers in society, those who love to brag about what they've done, although they highly exaggerate their accomplishments. Uh, there is a uh, an interesting narrative. Um, was it the right way to? Um, yeah, from Abdullah ibn Amr bin Rabi'ah. And Abdullah ibn Amr bin Rabi'ah says that he was a child and that he was playing and that the Prophet ﷺ visited them when uh, at that time. And that his mother, Abdullah bin Rabi'ah's mother, called him and he didn't want to come because he was playing. So she said, come, I want to give you something. So the Prophet ﷺ said to her, what did you want to give him? And she said, I was going to give him a date, Tamr. And the Prophet ﷺ said, good, because if you would have 
called him and then and said, I want to give you something, and then did not give him something, that would have been written a lie with God. And that, now this narrative is, is interesting because it actually tells us something about how Surah al Saf, and then the Prophet recited Surah al Saf to just complete the, the um, Whether it is braggers, whether it is people that said, oh, we are willing to sacrifice, or but did not sacrifice, did not rise to the occasion. Whether it is a mother that promises her child something or, rep, or tells her child, I'm gonna give you something and then either deliver or not deliver. In all these situations, the challenge is the same. That this message, your position as a Muslim, your, and remember that in Surah Tasaf, we're going to come to the issue of the message as God's light that this message, God's light, will not be served by people who, whose actions are not in harmony with their words. A very powerful ethic that if you promise, you must deliver. If you say, I will do, you must do. But more fundamentally, and as we'll see, is that if you say, I believe, there are things that follow from saying, I believe. And what follows is not simply that I obey God's laws, but beyond that, as Surah Tusaf tells us right after this, so first it tells us, Kabura maktan indallahi an taqulu ma la tafalun. It is most hated. And this should, you know, it's, it's, it's remarkable because you'll find Muslims sit there, freak out about the most mundane of legal technicalities, but break promises or live in irreconcilable inconsistencies in their existence without giving it a second thought. While Allah says, Kabura Maktan, Kabura Maktan, is, it is most hated that indeed your deeds are not consistent with what you say you believe in. What does this all lead to? Uh, right away, Inna Allah yuhibbu al-ladhina yuqatiluna fi sabilihi saffan ka'annahum bunyanun masus. Muhammad Asa translates this as, Verily God loves only those who fight in God's cause in solid ranks as though they were a building firm and compact. This is a very good example of how if you are reading the Quran without proper methodological comprehension, 
you can completely lose the point. You could understand this as saying that God changed the topic. You could understand this as saying, first God is saying, you know, don't say one thing and act another way. And then God changed the topic to saying, well, and when you fight, fight in solid ranks. And this is indeed the way a lot of Muslims understand it, unfortunately. But think about it. Imagine if we didn't take the Quran as speaking eternally to in, in, in a timeless fashion. And we, what we read the Quran in a very literal way. And so we conclude from this that when Muslims fight, they should stand in solid ranks. And imagine that what followed from that is that you approach warfare in all ages and all times by fighting in solid ranks. Well, while solid ranks might or might not have worked at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, because sometimes the most effective way to fight is not in solid ranks, but in hit and run, for instance, like the Mongols did, who never fought in solid ranks. And in the modern age, if you fight in solid ranks, you'll be obliterated in a second. Completely useless. So what is the point of Allah saying, Allah loves those who fight in Allah's cause in solid ranks? If you understand it in a literal way, in a myopic way, you've completely lost the point. As many scholars pointed out, solid ranks is metaphorical. As they put it, the point is istiwa in niya. Is that in the same way, and there's a hadith that Allah, and again, a hadith that sort of gets to the, um, that Allah loves those who stand in a solid rank in prayer, loves those who stand in a solid rank in warfare, and loves those who stay up in Qiyam al-Layl, who worship late at night. Istiwa in niya means that in the same way that solid ranks in prayer is metaphorical, solid ranks in this context is metaphorical. When we stand in prayer shoulder to shoulder, we are telling Allah that when it comes to you, we will put you ahead of our individual interests and our individual desires. That when it comes to worshiping you, we stand shoulder to shoulder, setting aside our differences, setting aside our competing desires, setting aside our competitions. It is an ideal that we represent vis-a-vis -vis God Every time we pray Jama'ah, that is precisely why when you attend Jama'ah prayer at Jum'ah and you find that the khatib or the entire dynamic is not a step towards achieving that goal, we've exactly violated what Surah Al-Saf told us to do. We've, we, we've We've not done what we what we've claimed we believe in. 
Do you see? If we are if we pray Jama'a and still we stand shoulder to shoulder, we've engaged in a symbolic act where we are telling Allah, you are the priority. Not our individual interests, not our petty feelings, not our competing desires, you are the priority. The extent to which we leave jama'a prayer, not feeling bonded as an ummah, we violated what Surat al-Saf said, we say one thing and we do another. This is also why, by the way, I believe that Jama'ah prayer is, is mandatory upon women because the same logic applies to men and women. That notion, that, that exercise of putting Allah ahead of any, everything. Now, bragging about your accomplishments is a trip in egoism. In order to serve this cause, for this cause, for God's light to truly be put ahead, it requires that you come together as a unity. We've learned in the other surah, the hypocrites are often, their, their biggest challenge is the tradition of tafakhur, the, the tradition of bragging about who your family is, who your, you know, your, your descendant, you, who your uh, forefathers were, the, the, uh, the exploits of your tribe, the exploits of your family, the exploits of your clan, and the idea that now Islam is coming and saying none of that matters. And not only that, but Arab, Persian doesn't matter. Ma uh, slave, master doesn't matter. This is what they had the hardest time with. Here, the Saf al Marsus in, in warfare is precisely that you harmonize your will. You harmonize your goals. You overcome your differences where you are clear about what your priorities are. If you fail to do this, then you've precisely fallen into the problem of you say one thing and you do another. I don't want to move on because this is so critical and it is the reason why we Muslims are in the mess we're in. The fact that Muslims can say they're Muslim and a Pakistani remains a Pakistani, an, a an Arab remains an Arab, a Syrian remains a Syrian, an Egyptian remains a Syrian, a Saudi remains a Saudi. We've, we've already committed a, a fundamental hypocrisy. Already. The fact that we come together and we claim that God is first and foremost but the way we worship God is all about the Anna, is all about me, is all about my salvation, is all about my prayers, it's all about my fasting, it's all about my zakah, it's all about the ways that I will make it to Jannah. But you don't see yourself as a part of a community that serves God in order to achieve something f 
for humanity and in humanity, as we will see in the rest of Surah Asaf in a second. The fact that it is not about you making it to Jannah, but about your entire Ummah symbolizing a march towards light. And in fact, Allah, as we'll see in Surah Asaf, tells us that this is not just about you Muslims. This has always been what the prophets are about. This is about every message that came from this God, the only God. So, it is not a new thing, but it is the challenge that human beings consistently, instead of truly recognizing that they are part of creation, in, in a state of submission to the one and only God, they themselves become demigods. One of the most, one of the hardest things for people to understand is that if you live and die, all your ibadah, you, you pray and you fast and you do all of things, but it is all about you. You failed. Because it is, you are part of creation charged with bringing light upon creation. If you lived and died only worrying about you, you've, the Allah ta'ala Allah, you've made yourself a God. As if, Everyone else can go to hell as long as you're fine. That is fundamentally inconsistent with what everything Islam is about. So right away, by by confronting us with this thing, with this issue of how dare you say one thing and act in another. Allah gives us that the ultimate challenge. And then in order, the challenge that, of course, and if it is the hardest thing is to accept that I would sacrifice my self-interest because I am part of a larger cause that far transcends me as an individual. So, right after that, to put this this preamble in context, Allah takes us right away to Musa alayhi salam. وَإِسْقَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ يَا قَوْمِ يَا قَوْمِ لما تؤذونني وقد تعلمون أني رسول الله إليكم فلما زاغوا أزاغ الله قلوبهم والله لا يهدي القوم الفاسقين وإذ قال عيسى بن مريم يا بني إسرائيل إني رسول الله إليكم مصدقا لما بين يدي من التوراة والإنجيل من التوراة ومبشرا ومبشرا برسول يأتي من بعد اسمه أحمد فلما جاءهم بالبينات قالوا هذا سحر مبين. Okay, so Muhammad Asad translates that now when Moses spoke to his people, it was the same truth that he had in mind. Oh my people, why do you cause me grief? The while you know that I am an apostle of God sent unto you. And so when they swerved from the right way, God let their hearts swerve from the truth. For God does not bestow God's guidance upon inequitous folk. And this happened too when Jesus, the son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, behold, I am an apostle of God unto you, sent to confirm the truth of whatever there still remains of the Torah. 
and to give you the glad tidings of an apostle who shall come after me whose name shall be Ahmed. Okay. So first the example of Musa, then the example of Isa. Unfortunately, the tafsir don't tie the threads of the surah together. But it can only be understood as the threads together. So what is it that Musa As the Torah itself says, if anyone reads the Torah, they're struck by how the Torah constantly talks about the struggles between Musa and the Israelites. Musa, السلام, among many other things, <clears throat> tells his people, for instance, to enter Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa. This is in Surah An-Nisa. To that they must enter and the Holy Land. And look how Palestine is from ancient times for those modern Muslims that try to pretend that Palestine is not holy because th this is a new you know trend sponsored by the Emirat and Saudi that oh who cares Palestine is not important it's it's we only care about Mecca and Medina the, the, let's be very because I am I will keep saying this that statement that Jerusalem is the third holy site in Islam is a colonial invention and don't you dare repeat it. Jerusalem is not the third holy site in Islam. Jerusalem is a co-equal holy site to Mecca in Islam. It is more holy than Medina. Medina doesn't have a status in the Quran. But Jerusalem is the holy land from time immemorial. And it is the the point at which that ties us to the Abrahamic religions, to the line of prophets, whether Israelite or non-Israelite. Anyway, so Musa tells the Israelites to enter the Holy Land, and there was, and the response is fiha kumun jabbarin that. The, those who are in it are Jababira. They're, they're, they're powerful and tyrants, and we can't possibly defeat them. Or can't we? So, constantly, the, 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 the harm that Musa is complaining about is not that his followers are calling him names or beating him, although there is a tradition that claims that they would mock uh, Musa's speech or mock uh, his walk, Allahu Alam. But the context is, as many Muslim scholars have, have noted, this is, the, is that while the Israelites claimed that they in fact are believers and they've accepted. That's why Musa tells him, and you know that I am God's apostle because he's talking to those who say we believe. He's not talking to those who didn't believe in him. But how are they harming him? They're harming him because they are being hypocritical or being cowards. They're failing to deliver on their beliefs they're failing to sacrifice and put God foremost because they have other priorities. And if you remember from Surah An-Nisa that, you know, they start uh, missing 
the the luxury, although they lived in in as uh, in um, in oppression in Egypt, but they start mi- missing the material things they enjoyed in Egypt, and they find life in Sina too difficult, too harsh, and they start telling Moses, "Oh, come on, you know we've sacrificed a lot." We, we, if you remember again from Surah An Nisa, oh, you know we were oppressed, but at least we had. You know the food we you know yes we didn't have our freedom but we had uh, we filled our stomachs and we lived a comfortable life amazingly this is the way that the quran taught, positions this is this is such a betrayal to musa that it is as if they are inflicting harm upon their apostle. It's like your inconsistency, your hypocrisy, is fundamentally hurtful to me as the Torah itself says, because Musa constantly complains that this breaks his heart and breaks the heart of his brother. And that in the Torah also, that when his brother dies, that they even accuse Musa of having killed his brother, which really hurts. But this is from the Torah anyway. Um, Okay. So, you understand from the context here that this is the same message that Musa came with. And then right after Musa is Isa. Musa tells his followers about the coming of Isa. And in Islamic belief, he also tells them about the coming of Muhammad, but anyway. But, and Isa, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a second, tells his followers about the coming of Muhammad, Ali Sallallahu So this is the same message. This is the same message. This is the same dynamic requiring the same level of honesty, truth, dedication. A um, um, what was I saying? Okay. A point about Jesus and what he tells his followers about the coming of Muhammad. There's actually the footnote in if you have the Muhammad Asa translation, the footnote on page six is actually quite good. Uh, sorry, not page six, uh, page 861, footnote six is actually uh, quite uh, good. The original Aramaic reportedly what Jesus says, he talks about the coming of a Mauhamana. A Hamana is someone who is praised and revered. Imam Hamana is someone who is consistently praised and consistently revered. The Mao is a continuing verb. Now, so the, the Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, talks about the coming of Imam Hamana after him an apostle who will be known as the consistently praised and consistently revered. Now, if you notice, Hamana in Aramaic is very similar to the word Hamd in Arabic. And from Hamd, which means to thank or to be thankful, 
from Hamd comes the word Muhammad. Muhammad means the consistently praised and consistently revered. And this, when, of course, the Aramaic uh, Gospels are lost, but what we have are the Greek translations of what was the, the Greek translation of the original. And the, the Greek translations were clearly Romanized, Romanized in a variety of ways, meaning that they were written in order to make Christianity more acceptable to a Roman population that was accustomed to, or that was well acquainted with the whole notion of Trinity and the, the idea of a Trinity of gods and so on and so forth. But the part that concerns us is the Greek translation. So, and here I'm, because as I said, Muhammad Asad does a, a really, he, he summarizes it really well. So in the Gospel of St. John, the Mahamana was translated as Paraclotus or Paraclotus. I hope I'm, yeah, as close as I can pronounce it. Which means the comforter. The, the apostle that will become is a Paraclotus, which means a comforter. While the much praised, the Mauhamana, is not a paraclotus, it would be a paraclotas, a tas instead of a tos. It is very likely that in the Greek translation, there was a corruption from the tas to the tos from a comfort instead of a much praised to a comforter because at the time the idea of a the idea of an apostle that will come to be a comforter to people was meaningful but the idea of an apostle that will become that will be much praised by people brought no comfort to anyone And it is such a small change that for the scribes of the Bible didn't seem like a significant big deal. I mean, why do we have to stick to precisely the Mahamana as a much praised rather than the idea of someone who will come to bring us an enormous amount of comfort? But that little corruption altered the entire prediction of Muhammad as the apostle who would be coming. Anyway, so both Musa and Isa are part of the same message. Isa is the last prophet in the line of Israelites' prophets. Muhammad is the last prophet in the line of non-Israelite prophets. But both belong to the same tree of Abrahamic prophets. Okay. Now, notice what comes after that, eight. So, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنِ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبُ وَهُوَ يُدْعَى إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِ قَوْمُ الظَّالِمِينَ يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفِئُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَاللَّهُ مُتِمُّ نُورَهُ وَاللَّهُ مُتِمُّ نُورِهِ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون so, Muhammad Asad 
And who could be more wicked than those who invent such a lie about a message from God? Seeing that he is but being called to self-surrender unto God. But God does not bestow God's guidance upon evil doing folk. They aim to extinguish God's light with their utterances, but God has willed to spread God's light in all its fullness, however hateful this may be to all who deny the truth. He, or, or God, it is who sent forth God's apostle with the task of spreading guidance and the religion of truth to the end that God make it prevail over all false religion, however hateful this may be to those who ascribe divinity to aught but God. Okay. So notice the move here that those who failed Musa السلام, and those who failed Isa السلام, and those who failed Muhammad are all described as كذب على الله وهو يدعى إلى الإسلام as all having lied or denied God كذب على الله lied about God or lied to God while they are all being called to a single thing and the single thing is Islam as Ibn Ajiba says that the sharia'ah that the laws are different but the faith is one the laws that you are in that that came with Musa, Isa, Muhammad are different, but the the religion is one. It is the religion of Islam, the religion of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, the religion of surrendering to God. Meaning what? Meaning Tanzihillah, the religion where you recognize what we started the surah with, with subhanallah, that there, there is no like to Allah. And that Allah should be the priority. And that submitting to this God means accepting that you collectively with other human beings have a goal to accomplish that transcends the egotistical individuality of human beings. Now, so that is the Islam that everyone is being invited to. And that is the Islam of all the prophets. And that is the Islam that is either betrayed with all the prophets or honored with all the prophets. And that Islam is described as as Inur. And Allah comes here and says something that is very critical at this time that Surat As-Saf is revealed. It, uh, sorry, it wasn't Ibn Ajima who said that the laws are, are uh, different but the religion is one. It was Al-Matiridi. Al Al-Matiridi in his tafsir, who says that. Um, so, first, so, yuriduna liyutfi'u nur Allah bi afwahim. This message that came with Musa, alayhi salam, came with Isa, alayhi salam, came with Muhammad, alayhi salam, is God's light.
And Allah tells us at this point that God's light, i.e. the message, will be established. Now, this is quite a challenge and quite a prediction at a time when it wasn't that long ago that the last major battle, Uhud, didn't go well for Muslims, that there is a very large number of hypocrites, a very large number of people who didn't even convert to Islam, and the Jewish tribes are still there and doing whatever they're doing. In other words, at this high point of stress and anxiety, Allah comes and, and makes a type of challenge that only comes from a God, saying, you know what? God's light will reach completion, meaning the message this time with Musa, it was derailed. With Isa, it was derailed. This time, it will not be derailed, and it will be. It will achieve completion. This is also why it was Surah As-Saf. Hypocrites, where the, the hypocrites of Medina, were very antagonized by what became a very big part of Muslim culture to the point that in when we in Eid when we do uh, 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 we we repeat this idea of walaw kariha kafirun that Allah's religion will be victorious even if the enemies of religion hate hate it to be so so, but it is fascinating that Allah doesn't say, all Allah comes out beginning and tells you, God loves those who stand shoulder to shoulder in warfare. And that's the metaphor Allah gives you. But when Allah comes and warns you about how the risk to Allah's light might be extinguished. Look, it says, يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفُؤُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ They want to extinguish God's light with their words. Not through warfare. Because what is far more dangerous, it is, Moses message was not derailed through warfare. It was derailed through speech. Wrong theology. Isa's message was not derailed through warfare. It was derailed through speech. Wrong theology. And Allah here sa says, note, it is the same dynamic. Human beings are egotistical. And because they're egotistical, they see everything from the prism of their individuality. And because they see everything from the prism of their individuality, that's the risk, that's the danger to Allah's light coming through. But right here, for you Muslims, at this time, this message will reach completion. That is why Omar ibn Khattab reportedly goes to the Prophet and says, I am worried. I'm worried that now Muslims, having heard this, that they will you know, relax, say, well, Allah will take care of it. There, there's no report as to how the Prophet responded, just to, that's you know, the anxiety is expressed. However, 
perhaps the response doesn't need to come from the Prophet ﷺ because the response to that anxiety comes from the Quran itself, from Surah As-Saf itself. Because while Allah says, you know, this time, this is the Prophet, Muhammad is the Prophet that has been awaited all along. The Mawhamana that Jesus spoke about, that's, that's this Prophet, the final Prophet. And so God's light, the, the, it must be so that God's light will be, shine through this time. That the message will be completed because otherwise you can't have a final prophet. However, as to you, the question is, does, is the message completed with you or without you? And this is, by the way, when a lot of Muslims, you know, mo modern day, you, it's a fad. People come and say, oh, you know, ta uh, for, former Muslims, and they like to brag about as if, you know, if Allah wants Allah's light to shine through, it will shine with you or without you. I don't care if you left Islam or you embraced Islam or if you're you do me no favors you do God no favors by being a Muslim this is not about that at all we think that we control things but it is not about controlling things because it is Allah that controls things it is about your service, your role, your morality, are you a part of the light or are you a part of the darkness? It is not about, but for you, there will be no light. No, it, the question is, are you part of the light or part of the darkness? So I'll tell you the answer that Allah gives to this, but let's take a short break. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Well, in verse 5, قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ يَا قَوْمِ لِمَا تُؤْذُونَنِي وَقَدْ تَعْلَمُونَ أَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِي الْقَوْمَ الْفَاسِقِينَ So, that The, the the thing I, I, I um, overlooked or I didn't um, underscore is that this portion of the ayah that and so when they swerved from the right way God let their hearts swerve from the truth for God does not bestow God's guidance upon inequitous folk It is often commented here that the, the Arabic is فَلَمَّا عَدَلُوا عَنْ اتِّبَاعَ الْحَقِّ أَضَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ عَنِ الْهُدَى وَأَسْكَنَهَا الشَّكِّ وَالْحِيرَةِ وَالْخُزْلَانِ That when their purported beliefs or their avoid beliefs did not match their deeds. When they embraced this level of hypocrisy, whatever that level is, um, that Allah allowed, because they, they've taken the wrong path, then Allah allowed their hearts to swerve from the truth. And, and what that concretely means is that instead of certitude, you are haunted by doubt. Instead of being clear about what your relationship is 
with Allah and Allah's nur instead of having in the core of your heart and the core of your intellect a firm grasp of what God is to you and what you are to God and a firm grasp of Allah's light and what it means to be a manifestation of God's light, you are in fact overcome by doubt, anxiety, confusion, all, all the things that are entailed by the notion of swerving. <clears throat> now, extinguishing God's light with their words, notice, and I want to emphasize this, notice that you do so when you argue about or you misrepresent what God's message is about or when in fact your words do not match your deeds what you claim what your your system of beliefs are inconsistent with the out product with the what you end up actually achieving in the world. That is, that is extingu extinguishing God's light. Everything, it, it's like the, the Prophet والسلام, he said that Allah hates or Allah condemns those who make people distrust God or God hates those who make people hate God. You, through the way you embrace the light of God or what is through ignorance, through egoism, through small-mindedness, through, through closed-mindedness, through fanaticism, through extremism, through a whole host of things. In, in fact, you could become, instead of a messenger to God's light, you could become a corruption of God's light. And that's itfa nurillah bil afwah, that you are extinguishing God's light through your, your, your words, your speech, your speech, whether words or actions. The other thing that Joe reminded me of is that notice that with the Israelites, the corruption of God's message is that they've turned the message of Moses into a tribal message. The, the itfa nurillah, the extinguishing God's light, is that they tribalized the message. It became a message for the Israelites, about the Israelites. It, the entire Torah is a narrative of basically the story of the, it's like a historical narrative of the Israelites, m mostly myth than, than historical reality. But it is as if, God is only concerned about the Israelites and what is the Israelite and, and, and the Israelites are a manifestation of God's complete will and the center of God, they're the chosen people and so on. The Christians corrupt or extinguished God's light by Hellenizing Christianity. Another form of corruption, but again, it is the power of human beings to alter and corrupt through various 
to the the loss of or the 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 um, misperception of priorities and understanding their real place vis-a-vis their Lord. Okay. So while Allah then says that, listen, this, the entire line of prophets was about this apostle, Muhammad, the coming of Muhammad, and therefore Allah will complete this message. This is immediately then followed by something that doesn't communicate to Muslims that their victory is a foregone conclusion. It just says that Allah will complete his light. And elsewhere, we know that the Quran says repeatedly to Muslims that if if you fail, Allah will bring others to replace you. But Allah then says, هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ تِجَارَةٍ تُنْجِيكُمْ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ So right after that, that declaration about Allah completing God's light, what follows this, um, okay. uh, this is Muhammad Asad's translation again. All you who have, uh, who have believed or who have attained to faith, shall I point out to you a bargain that will save you from a grievous suffering in this world and the life to come. In this world and the li- and life to come. You are to believe in God and God's apostle and to strive hard in God's cause with your possessions and your lives. This is for your own good if you bought new. If you do so, God will forgive your sins and in the life to come will admit you to gardens through which running waters flow and into goodly mansions in those gardens of perpetual bliss. bliss. That will be the triumph supreme and will grant you another thing that you're dearly, uh, uh, sorry, and with withal, God will grant you yet another thing that you dearly love, secure from God in this world and a victory soon to come. And thereof, O prophet, give though a glad tiding to all who believe. Okay, so, Allah reminds them that this is a deal. If you believe, and if this belief is confirmed or affirmed, that you commit to yourself you commit yourself to a jihad, a jihad in which you exert yourself and your possessions. So everything about who you are and your possessions are committed to this cause. And ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ And this indeed, if you only knew, it is what is good, it is what is for your own good that this path of sacrifice, although you might perceive it as against self-interest, is in fact, is precisely for your own good. Other than your reward in the hereafter, then there will be another thing that Allah knows you covet, you would truly love. Nasrun min Allah wa fathun qareeb wa bashir al mu'minin. That if you are truthful, consistent, 
in your commitment, in this tijara, in this deal with God, that you don't say, I believe in God and the Prophet, but you hold back on the way that you commit yourself and commit your possessions. You don't qualify this by, well, I don't know, I have other commitments, I have competing interests, I'm not sure if, you know, my yeah, my life is about serving a cause, but there are other complications involved. If you are, and, and this will be the way Surah Tassaf is going to end, we'll, we'll, we'll close the circle on this. We'll say that if your commitment is up to par in the sense that it rises to the level that is truly sincere, then there is the hereafter. But other than the hereafter, Allah promises them in their time that there will be a further consequence. That there will be a victory soon. Fathun Qareeb. Again, this promise to Muslims at that time is from, I mean, if you read it, it's remarkable. Because if you understand all the challenges, Allah is coming to them and saying, if you, I promise you, if your commitment is sincere and true, victory is yours. That is something I'm going to take care of. Okay. Now, does this mean that the same promise, Nasrun min Allah wa Fathun Qareeb, holds for all Muslims at all times? The answer is no. The historical Quran is that the promise to be delivered in the lifetime of those receiving the Quran was to them. But what we do know is that if we are sincere in our service, then if it is Allah's will that there be a victory, a fulfillment, in other words, in the in the in if you if you think of alternative fates, if Muslims do X, the consequences will be this. If Muslims fail in doing X, the consequences will be that. That if Allah has a victory in the possible fate of things, that is what will materialize. Not necessarily in our lifetime, not in our, on our time, but on God's time. You are not asked, you are not being asked to believe in Nasr min Allah wa Fathun Qareeb in, in your historical moment. You are only required to believe in the tijara rabiha ma Allah that if you do your part, Allah will do Allah's part. Now, why is this important? Because often you find so many Muslims if they believe that they are committed and sincere and they don't get the results they want, they despair. But that's precisely the wrong dynamic. It is not on your time. You don't control this world. You are asked to, to uphold the ethics of the process itself. That if you say you believe, your actions be consistent with your belief. That you are part of pushing forward Allah's light. That you are not part of promoting the darkness. You are part of promoting the light. 
which is a very heavy responsibility because if you are promoting stupid religion you are part of promoting the dark if you are sitting there and saying women cannot go to school as the Taliban are doing you're part of promoting the dark if you're sitting there and turning God's religion into turning God into a tyrant who is entirely unreasonable and entirely incomprehensible to human beings you are part of God's darkness not God's light you are part of the darkness not God's darkness the darkness because what you're representing makes people repulsed by religion not drawn to religion now if you uphold the and, and critically that you are a people who do not say one thing you do not talk about this is it's not about God, it's not about that oh you know small promises it's about for instance you don't sit there and talk about how in islam there is justice but the way you conduct your life doesn't have the semblance of justice you don't sit there and talk about how in islam the dignity of human beings is honored but the way you conduct your affairs you don't honor the dignity of human beings you don't sit there and talk about how in Islam God loves those who seek knowledge but you yourself don't honor knowledge meaning that you have medical doctors who pretend to be fuqaha and fuqaha who pretend to be medical doctors that's dishonoring knowledge you you as human beings you must be fully responsible for what comes out of your mouth and what your declared beliefs are and nothing corrupts God's message as the if you sit there and you talk till the I don't know when God honors woman uh, Islam honors woman Islam protects woman Islam liberated woman but then we discover that you marry and divorce women like a lot of imams do left and right you know you hardly you treat that's again that's precisely what the moral challenge that this surah puts right center and stage if you are like that then you are precisely like those who corrupted the message of Musa and those who corrupted the message of Asa now you are among those who are corrupting the message of Muhammad so now notice how the surah closes ya ayyuhalladhina amanu kunu ansar allahi كما قال عيسى ابن مريم للحواريين من أنصار إلى الله قال الحواريون نحن أنصار الله فآمن الطائفة من بني إسرائيل وكفر الطائفة فأيدنا الذين آمنوا على عدوهم فأصبحوا ظاهرين. Okay. Again, it addresses itself to those who say we believe. Those who say, Ya ayyuhalladhin amanu, those of you who say you believe. So, Kunu Ansar Allah. Muhammad Asa translates it as be helpers in the cause of God. No. Kunu Ansar Allah. It's not be helpers, it is stand for the cause of God. Ansar are those who give a victorious aid. Those who stand with you are your Ansar. It's not just those who help you, but those who stand side by side next to you are your Ansar. Okay, so (laughs) 
be on sar to Allah and then Allah says as when Jesus asked the al Hawariyun and the, and I'll explain the, this in a second al Hawariyun the disciples but the choice of word here is really important because the apostles where Jesus asked them at a moment of great difficulty and a choice that will cost these apostles their lives. The, the, the apostles are not, by standing with Jesus, they have everything to lose and nothing to gain materially. They, by standing with Jesus, they will face persecution, torture, loss of possession, loss of property, loss of prestige, and perhaps even death, as some of them did, in fact, happen. And, but they're called al-Hawariyun, and here is significant, because al-Hawari, it is said that it is not, probably not historically accurate, but it is said reported that the apostles were um, engaged in the job of cleaning garments that they were um, like laundry laundry people that they clean stuff but that's probably not historically accurate uh, the, it's, but anyway why are they known as al hawariyun al hawari al hawari are people who purify themselves And here, when Allah uh, refers to them as the Hawariyun, the self-purifiers, the self-purifiers who in ultimately their commitment involves an incredible amount of selflessness. But then what follows from that? So that commitment led to some Israelites following Jesus, some Israelites not following Jesus. But what it definitely also led to is a great deal of persecution and sacrifice. From the time, for you know, set aside the corruption when the Roman Church holds the various councils in Nicaea and Alexandria some 300 plus years after the death of Jesus, but was preserved the message of Jesus itself at all, was numerous people following in the footstep of the disciples who were persecuted generation after generation, kept the religion that we call Christianity, the religion of Jesus, alive, the message alive, and that the whole narrative about, you know, the image of Christians being thrown to the lions by the Romans, that's what we're talking about. Before Christianity became a state religion and became officially Hellenized, there was the Christianity that survived for 300 years, generation after generation of people who sacrificed everything for that faith and فَأَيَّدْنَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا عَلَىٰ عَدُوِّهِمْ فَأَصْبَحُوا ظَاهِرِينَ and so ultimately it is those people 
became victorious through their sacrifices. These various individuals who were, in a summary fashion, tortured and killed by the Romans, thrown to the lions by the Romans, who died not knowing what is going to become of Christ or the Christian faith. Allah says, notice, on Allah's time, not your time, that the group that followed Christ became victorious and victory here is not necessarily the way that you would imagine victory. It, the survival of Allah's light is the victory. So, clearly, Muslims understood that Allah is not telling them to be, become Christians. So when Allah says to them that those who followed Christ became victorious, but they understood that Allah, Allah is telling them about those who said they believed and sacrificed accordingly. And in fact, in their case, the deal with God at Tijara Allah meant that they gave up everything. They gave up life, they gave up possessions, they gave up prestige. They were for the longest time were completely excluded from the temple, were completely excluded by the rabbis from even any association with the uh, Mosaic tradition, the, the tradition of Moses, were seen as complete heretics and were targeted systematically for a few centuries by Romans. But the sacrifice is what kept the light of God alive. Surah Al-Saf, in the most succinct and sort of no-nonsense fashion, comes and says, Allah knows that there are many of you who are BSers, who love to BS. Allah knows that there are many of you who are in it because they're thinking of spoils of war, because they, you know, whatever the, your, your, your complex matrix of motivations. But true, the truly committed stand shoulder in shoulder in self-effacement and self-denial putting the cause first and understanding that the cause might require a complete and total sacrifice. That they, as they leave this world, might not see at all in what way God's light was upheld. Because in fact, after Surah Al-Fasl, many of the people who were around and received it died. I mean, they were killed in battle. Um, and after Surat al fas it became the lines of demarcation between those who increasingly, the disciples around the Prophet, would identify as hypocrites. And the, the line of demarcation who became increasingly labeled as the hypocrites. Uh, became more stark because those who those who refrained from bragging and who made their deeds speak for themselves or make the you know they, they spoke through their deeds were identified as al muqarrabun as the those who are truly part of the inner circle of the prophet and 
the there de developed an ethic. All the Arabs loved bragging poetry. I mean, it was in, an ingrained part of Arab culture that you brag. The reason for poetry is that you exaggerate and brag. Surat al-Saf was it played a huge role in changing that cultural norm. Bragging lost its magic. It, it is no longer effective and it's no longer welcome. And okay, let's see if I forgot anything. No, alhamdulillah. Okay, that's it. The surah itself, alhamdulillah. And the dhikr is verse 2, by the way. Alhamdulillah, I think we're five minutes from Maghrib, so um, I just wanted to say, you know, like, Sheikh here recently was saying that um, as we're getting into this sort of last home stretch of the um, the surahs, you know, now we, we, are, we have fewer than 40 to complete um, before we actually have finished the entire Quran. It's like that last home stretch, and he starts thinking about like the level, the weight of the accountability and what we know. And I feel like sometimes like this surah was so powerful and so, um, you know, it just silences you because you, you feel like, what can, what can I possibly say after that? And I know at the break, um, you know, some people were saying, I feel like this surah is speaking directly to me, but it, you know, it speaks directly to all of us. And it's, it's like a message that is, um, it's so penetrating that it just, you know, like part of you just wants to kind of crawl into a, a cave and, and just like, okay, I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> like I have to think about all the things that I do that I've, that I've said that I, that I haven't actually done. And, you know, so are there certain stories that I, this is one that I feel like it's just, it just silences you, you know, it makes you really ashamed and, and sort of, um, it makes things so clear and so truthful and just like, okay, you know, like even with Surah Juma, it was penetrating in that it's like, okay, I could see myself sitting and listening to the drama and feeling like, okay, I need to go because I can hear the drum beat of the caravan and I have to go buy stuff for my family. That was very like phase one, like, yes, I could see myself do that. This surah today was like, boom. Okay, you know, what do you say? What do you really believe? What you call yourself Muslim? Here's, here's the ways that, you know, that you, um, have to really reflect and even like when you say you know um, it makes it so simple like your your, your job here on earth is to um, keep the light of God moving forward you're either part of the light of God or you're part of the darkness there's no in between and um, it's even interesting then it makes you feel like okay, for that level of commitment um, you know it implies that you like modern Muslims here uh, you know um, get really tripped up with a lot of things, you know, like, oh, is this what God wants? Is this not what God wants? But this actually speaks to really what's inherent to everyone is you know what's light and you know what's not. So strip away the law, strip away the technicalities, strip away all the like, you know, the BS that we can confuse ourselves with. Um, but do you know what light is? And are you willing to do what you need to do to move it forward and sacrifice and, and you know, and it's not easy, but, um, I think these are the types of clarifying surahs that just really, um, they're so humbling and so powerful. And so, I mean, I, I, for me, I'm just, I'm so grateful and I'm sure I, I speak for everyone here and everyone who's watching that this is really such a gift and, and thank you so much um, for sharing this knowledge and wisdom and gift with us. Because I, I don't, I imagine that this is not the message that other people find when they read the surah. Um, 
So I don't know, I, I want to ask you, at, or kick off the Q&A, obviously, with a question about your engagement with this surah, um, but I don't know if you want to start there or if you want to take a break and then have us pray Maghrib and then we can come back. Uh, is it Maghrib yet? It one minute. Fine. It's one minute. Uh, let, let's pray Maghrib and then. Okay, and then we'll come back. So in the meantime, um, if you have a question, please send it through the chat, and then we can start in the Q&A when we come back, inshallah. Thank you. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I hope we all had a nice little moment to cry and collect ourselves <laughs> after. <laughs> this was such an incredible surah. I, I thought what I would do is just um, share a couple of, of uh, highlights that I thought were really powerful and meaningful. That um, And first let me just say, this surah has not been adopted. So if anyone wants to adopt, this is an incredible one to, to, to support the publication of. Um, I, I think what, what was especially so powerful about this, especially as a convert, um, is the idea that you know all of creation supplicates to your Lord. And so when you understand now that, okay, human beings and jinn are the only ones that actually have a choice not to supplicate, but then it, it's like it makes it so easy at, the, at a very um, top level view. You're either part of creation that supplicates your Lord or you're not. And I think that is such a powerful idea. And again, if you're either part of the light or you're part of the darkness. And the um, when you were saying that um, when people whose hearts stray, Allah allows their hearts to stray and how that manifests in doubt, anxiety, uh, and a loss of certainty in, in the beauty and light of Allah. Again, that's so powerful because these are like indicators that we can use to look at ourselves and say, do I feel doubt? Do I feel anxiety? Okay, this is a sign of this. Do I feel certainty in Allah? And, and those are just incredible tools. Um, and then even the idea of, um, you know, so this surah is called Asaf, which in my translation meant solid lines. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that's so powerful about what we do here is just that, that from this knowledge, we're given permission to think and use our reason, um, which feels so heretical in so many spaces, because I could very easily see myself sitting in a mosque or coming to up to an imam and say, you know that this idea that we have to fight in solid lines, you know, maybe there's a metaphorical way of understanding this. And I could hear in my mind someone saying, oh, no, 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 this means that, you know, well, you have to fight in, in a particular formation. Like, there's just such a common association I have. And sort of like as a convert, you feel very intimidated. I can't tell the man who's been Muslim all his life and who's my elder that there's another way to think about this. But through this, it's like we have permission to use our brains individually. And I think that's just very, very empowering. Um, and uh, then again, like again for a convert, you know, here's the connection with all human beings. You know, you're connected to Jews, you're connected to Christians um, and other Muslims. It's not about your label, but about the idea of, you know, we're all human beings and we all, you know, act in, in a particular way. You know, we will say we will do things and then we won't actually do them, or we could be hypocritical to different degrees. And that when you bring in the example of, of Musa and Isa, Moses and Jesus, and how they were so hurt because the human beings that they dealt with, their followers, um, broke their word. Um, and it's like, you didn't make God front and center. You didn't follow this path that I am telling you about, this gift that I'm giving you, you didn't accept it but instead you inserted your own egotistical individual desire over what God is calling us to do. Like this just is again a very beautiful way of saying, hey, we're all on the same human team. It's not about what label you are, but it's about the same message, the same prophets. And I think that, that just again gives you a lot of power and a, and a lot of um, comfort. Um, and that again, as all human beings together, as a human people, we're either all on the side of light or on the side of darkness. Um, and uh, and just the reminder that it's about putting God front and center um, and that we should be standing side by side with our fellow Muslims and not just standing side by side in Jama and then we leave Jama and now we're back to being Pakistani, we're back to being Arab. Even the idea of like, oh, this is the Pakistani mosque, this is the Arab mosque, this is the you know, Indonesian mosque. Uh, it's just, you know, we all say it, we all recognize it, but it's really, again, beautiful to, to hear it here um, underscored in this way. Um, and then even the, um, as uh, Joe had actually pointed out in the break, which um, I actually wanted to see if you could again say, the idea that there were Christians who, um, for the 300 years after Jesus, um, were so sacrificing, and, and, and Joe had pointed out that in a halakha several years back, you had mentioned that 
there are Christians who were so sacrificing and so um, so committed um, that they were a lesson for, for Muslims. I'm wondering if you could also talk about that. But so these were just, I mean, as again, as a convert with um, looking for like, um, you know, affirmation and confirmation that this is a message that pulls us all together as human beings and holds us to the same standard, not about labels and, and, and using, you know, the empowerment of our, our reasonable capacities. This was a really, really beautiful, powerful surah that just made everything very clear, very succinct and just easy. You're on light or not. So thank you so much, um, Sheikh. And I just, I, um, well, first let me ask you if you could share with us like your engagement with the Sura and what were the things that really, um, you know, occupied your mind when you were approaching it? If you remember, like, where you were when you were really engaged with this and when, when, when it was. Well, it was, uh, Bismillah ar rahim First, the, I remember that it was, I dealt with Surah Tassaf or, or concentrated on Surah Tassaf right before I did Surah Tassaf. Uh, it, it just uh, that I remember very distinctly that it was right before Surah Um because I also remember thinking, well, maybe I should do Surah Al-Juma first, but then I, for some reason I just thought, no, I'm gonna do Surah Al-Sof first. Um, so it was a, around the, I mean, in terms of chronology of our lives, it was around that same time that. You I mean shortly after, shortly before Surah Al-Jumma? I don't know when you did Surah <laughs> Well, um, what was it that last uh, when we talked about Surah Al-Jumma? I said uh, what year? What it was? Um, like shortly after Mama okay. passed away, the 2013, I think, mm. yeah, on 2013. So, um, the thing about Surah Al-Jumma, it, it, it the there's so many things that are because it starts out this this when you start out say yeah you it's it's talking to itself to those who believe but what it's saying it, it it's addressing itself to those who believe but it's saying is something very harsh it's saying why is it that you don't do what you say you'll do and so immediately what you think is, well, who was it talking to? Who, who are those people who believe but are saying, so it, it's, it, you know, you, you think of a group of disciples, Imam Ali radiallahu anh, Umar ibn Khattab, Abu Bakr, you know, and you say, well, it, it's not very likely that it's talking to any of these people. Um, but if you've had enough exposure to the Sira, you know that there's a second tier of companions um, who, while, while definitely, you know, up there, but not, n not at the same level as the first tier. Uh, but that that the other thing is that sort of stuff after you go through all the tafsir, every tafsir you can get your hands on. The thing that is sorry, is that seems very disjointed. It it none of the tafsir tell you what anything has to do with how the parts fit together. So you know it it tar starts up with tasbih, then it talks about not doing what you say you'll do. Then it talks about fighting in a straight line. Then it talks about Moses. Then it talks about Jesus. Then it talks about a it, it trade-off between uh, God and, I mean, tijara, between those who uh, are God, uh, a deal with God. Then it talks goes back to Jesus and it talks about the disciples. And you read all the tafsir that you can get your hands on and none of them so basically what they, they they seem to be telling you is that the surah has just like all these different messages that have nothing to do with, they don't fit. And so the research, um, fair, so I mean, you, you cover all the traditions about 
so-called occasions for revelations as Bab al-Nuzul. And none of them seem to, you know, the idea that people wanted to ask the Prophet what was the best thing, what was the most beloved thing to God, and then that they were, the idea that it was about the Battle of Uhud, the people who ran away in the Battle of Uhud were hypocrites. I mean, or those who withdrew with one third of the army before the battle began. And the, the, the grammatical tense, why do you say things and don't do them? It's not, it does, it's not the past tense. It doesn't say, why did you act in a way different than what you promised me? It says, why is it that you continue saying things that you don't do? And how does that fit with tasbih? And how does that fit with standing as a sof? And how does that fit with Moses? And how does that fit with Jesus? And how does that fit with the way that the surah closes? And this is when you you do your homework, you, you read everything, you look at all the traditions that you can get your hands on, you investigate everything, and then you take it, and you, then you pray on it. And this surah, because I was very worried that this is going to be the surah, and I remember this very distinctly, this is going to be the surah that proves that my methodology is wrong that it's going to be the surah that actually tells me, no, there is no thematic unity to the surah. Mm -hmm. I was very worried about that. And I was like pleading with Allah, Allah, let me see the truth. Because if I'm wrong, maybe this will be the surah that tells me I'm wrong. And when it came in dhikr, Once I saw it, I saw the surah as if I was seeing a picture. As if someone has diagrammed the surah in my mind. I was seeing all the ayat in light and all the connections of the ayat to one another. And once I saw it, I couldn't erase it from my mind. I knew exactly why God was, what's the connection between saying something and, and doing something else it has to do with standing shoulder to shoulder. I knew exactly why, what the, 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 uh, Khizlan, the disappointment of Moses in those who failed to deliver on their promises. I, everything connected. And then I went back, once that happened, I went back and reread all my notes again. And they fit like the pieces of a puzzle perfectly. It was like, you know, you, you, you're, you're hard of hearing and you, you're hearing often the way my hearing feels these days, uh, where you, you, you catch one word and you miss 10 so you're listening to a symphony and you're catching, you know, a tune, but then missing all, and then somehow you put on hearing devices and you actually hear the entire symphony now. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh my God, yeah, now it makes sense. So I went, when I, this is how it felt when I went back to the notes and I read all the notes again. I said, how could it possibly be that I didn't see it? It's so obvious. It's, it's, it, it's obvious why it was called Surah the Saf. It was obvious why everyone that commented that interacted with the Surah interacted the way they interacted with it. It was obvious why it ends the way it ends with those who purify themselves. And it's also obvious which connects to this issue that those who followed Jesus for until the Roman Empire, until a Roman emperor through his wife or whatever, that you know, the story, there are many different versions to the story, but anyway, that basically before it's adopted as the religion of an empire, what is astounding is that those who, not those who followed Paul, 
because the followers of James were far more numerous than the followers of Paul. Paul is, is, a, is a later Roman invention, much later Roman invention. I mean, sort of the, the Pauline Christianity was adopted with a lot of glee by the Roman Empire. But James and John the Baptist and his relation to Jesus, the amount of incredible sacrifice by people who knew that by affirming the truth of the message of Jesus, they're going to be tortured to death. And they continue to do it without armies, without battles. But here's the thing. They often went to their death shoulder to shoulder. If you read, you, you, the, enough of the history of martyrhood of the early Christians, they would be go to the to the Roman arena and be consumed by lions as they stood shoulder to shoulder. And these were people who did what they said. They said we believe, and they said that this belief means everything. It means more than life itself, and. Although they had no hopes of raising armies, they have no hopes of winning victories, they had no hopes of, they just went to their sacrifice to uphold the principle. There is no way they could have imagined that decades later, a couple of centuries, more than two centuries later, that somehow this is going to become the religion of an empire. But it kept, Jesus would have ended up being like many other um, uh, uh, many other what do you call it, rebels that were put to death by the Romans. Um, at that time, there were many. There were there were many of them that were in summary fashion. It is the dedication of the followers of Jesus and their incredible sacrifices. And this is what it is. It is not about that, you know, you're going to battle and you're raising a banner and you feel strong, you know, we're going to win this battle. It is about you going into what you believe is a losing battle, completely a losing battle, but you're going to sacrifice your, for a principle. The other thing that is very striking is that while the Israelites were obsessively upholding orthoproxy. The, Ez the, the Israelites but corrupted the religion of Moses by turning the Ten Commandments into an endless, highly ritualistic religion that had to do, being Jewish meant engaging in endless array of technical rituals which gave rabbis their authority because they could argue about minutia but it completely killed the soul of the the religion of Moses all these technicalities the Jews the, the Christians the followers of Christ sacrificed themselves the principle of clearly um, trumped all the, the, and this is part of the, the big, when, when the rabbis condemned them and as heretics and turned them over to the Romans to torture them and kill them, they were always, well, they're violating the laws. Mm -hmm. But in, their, their, the, in the fact that they understood that it, the, the laws were about the rabbis, not about God, is they were upholding the light of God. And this again struck me as you could, you could live and die obsessed with the technicalities of law, but not have a hint of God's light in you because you understood nothing about God. 
you you know and this for so many muslims that you look at and you see you know they 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 could live by their life is a whole series of rituals from the time they wake up to the time they go to sleep but they have no beauty they have no they have no um they have no glow they have no nur you you, you look at them and there's no nur so you you're worshiping all day and there's no nur what is wrong with that because you don't understand anything about God. God, God fills your soul. God makes you not want anything but God. God makes, makes your eyes see beauty in creation. You see the act of tasbih. You look at life and you see the act of tasbih. You don't need, you know, to count your 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 subhanallahs to 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 see the tasbih. You see the full tasbih, a million tasbihs, just by seeing the reality of God's creation. The nur, exactly that nur. <clears throat> and so, Surah Al-Saf went from. Oh my God. How am I going to figure this out? To how could have I ever existed without understanding the surah? Uh, let me ask this follow-up question um, from from Enjem because we are on the topic. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Sheikh. Jazakallah um, khair for this beautiful explanation of Surah Al Saf. I had uh, two questions. The first, in regards to the disciples and early Christians and their successes, um, though they sacrificed so much in trying to prevent the message from being perverted and thus Allah's light was not extinguished, might one argue that in some ways, before Islam came about, to rectify and bring back the truth from Allah that the misguidance of the church and Christians into believing um, the Trinity and, and Jesus as son of God, astaghfirullah, um, did in fact mean a defeat of sorts. Well, yes and no. Um, it, it is the sacrifices of the early Christians that kept the light alive. It is the intervention of the empire, uh, the Roman Empire, and its um, racialization of Christianity, because part of Hellenization of Christianity was its, um, its taking it out of its Eastern context to its Hellenized, Romanized context, um, which was a corruption. Now, but subhanAllah note that if this ha w had not happened, um, clearly uh, there was a plan that Allah had because Jesus tells them that there is an apostle that's coming and that this apostle is the final apostle and tells them that this apostle is going to establish the truth. So now this is, these are the questions we, we, we just cannot answer. Did Jesus know, did God tell Jesus that your message is going to eventually be corrupted? Um, you know, how does God knowledge relate to voluntarism and determination? You know, these are my very complicated questions. Did did God decree the coming of Muhammad والسلام, because God knew that eventually Christianity would be corrupted in this fashion? Uh, yani, th these are very hard questions to answer. Um, my sense is that, yes, God did know and that God but God's knowledge does not in any way take away from the 
the value of the sacrifice. I mean, the fact that God knows that there will come a time when um, the original Islam, where is the original Islam? I mean, if I ask you that question now, where is the Islam that was a liberation to humanity? Where is the Islam that when people went to Abyssinia and they, they refused to prostrate and, you know, and say, why didn't you prostrate? Because we were taught that a human being will never prostrate before another. Where is that Islam when today even the issue of slavery is obfuscated and confused in the minds of Muslims? Where is that Islam where instead of becoming a light unto human beings, we, I, I'm not sure what we even stand for anymore. Now, does this mean we were defeated, uh, that Islam was defeated? I don't think so. It just means that in the cycle, in the, the progression of history, this is the stage we're in. And it means that human beings failed, but God's will will be achieved. God's will will be accomplished. I would like to believe that God's will will be, that Islam will be victorious again with us or without us. Whether it's the, you know, the immigrants from Egypt like myself uh, or the immigrants from Pakistan who do it or whether it is British converts and American converts who want to do it. You know, some, I would like to believe that, but whatever Allah's will is, Allah's will is always victorious, whatever it is. Even if it is not, the, the only issue that I have to worry about and you have to worry about is that we, I and you are successful in relation to Allah's will, meaning that we do our part. That when we meet Allah, we don't fail that test of, and, and someone like, I, I, imagine, I mean, this is what's really scary, is that the, the more you know and the more you study, the more your accountability. So someone like me, well, you know, you, I give you the opportunity to read all these books and, you know, it's very scary to think of, did I really rise to the standard of being a Muslim scholar? Um, um, you know, I would love to stand I, I, I ache all the time to stand shoulder to shoulder with Muslims. That's what makes me constantly think about the Rohingyas and the Uyghurs and the Palestinians and is, I, 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 wherever Muslims suffer, I must stand shoulder to shoulder with them. But um, the challenge is that Muslims are also very good at making you feel that that you're ignored, that you're marginal. Um, you do. You just. You, you just have to be like precisely like these images of, the, of those <clears throat> martyrs. You adhere to the principles. If you have to go to the lion's den and be eaten, so be it. Um, and the hardest thing is that you must go, you must make these sacrifices with a smile on your face. You can't whine and you can't complain. You can't go sacrifice and, you know, gripe and complain all the way to the lion's den. That, that doesn't work either. Okay. Um, Anila gave me permission to ask her question, so I hope I, I do it justice. Um, in, in this surah, when, when you know, we're being told to sacrifice everything, you know, go to the lion's den or, um, you know, basically put God front and center, put everything, our wealth, our everything. Um, practically speaking, for us in our time, like, 
what does that really mean? Like, do we, should we, you know, like give all of our money, give all of our effort? You're like, you know, when you're thinking in terms of like, okay, well, I have a mortgage or I need to save for my child's education or, you know, like, are we supposed to be um, destitute in this process? Or how, how do we balance this call to support light with the modern demands of the day? Well, okay, so there are, at a bare, bare minimum is what is the zakah. But that's the bare minimum, right? And that's a sm very small amount, if you think about it. Um, two two and a half percent on what's saved for, or, you know, annually. It's, you know, for what you have for over. Um, beyond the zakah, the zakah is the sadaqa that uh, that the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, established as regularly paid during by Muslims at his time in order to support the Islamic cause. And um, I'll be transit. How, how much does it, what's the percentage that it comes to? Um, yeah, the 20, yeah, so it's, it's 20%. So it's the 20%. If, if, if you can satisfy the rights of your, your children have rights and their rights are to be fed and closed and go to get a good education, but their rights do not include that you have to make sure that you buy them their home you know, to buy a house for them so that they don't have to worry about buying a house. It does not include that you have to buy them an expensive car. It does not include that you have to buy them the best clothes and the most expensive clothes. So the 20% the is what at the, the sunnah, it's a sunnah that we all are very good at ignoring. I mean, it's amazing that you hear Muslims all the time Talk about follow the Sunnah of the Prophet. The sunnah of the Prophet is you do a number of tasbihs after this salah and this salah. Well, how about the Sunnah of the Prophet? Twenty percent of your income. Oh, well, that we never talk about. It's just we are hypocrites to the core. Our hypocrisy is sickening. Uh, because I can, there is a lot of disagreement about the number of tasbihs that the, of the Prophet did after this salah or that salah. But there is practically no disagreement about the twenty percent. You owe the 20%. You satisfy your needs, not your luxuries. And then the 20%. Now, if you want to even have a more secure deal with Allah, if you want to be like al Hawariyun, notice like Surah Al-Saf, what it tells you. If you want to be like the disciples of Jesus, like the disciples of Muhammad, because Muhammad himself had his own Hawariyun, now the disciples, the Hawariyun, if you want to have that status where you are, you, 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 you basically, you're making a deal with Allah that in the hereafter, I don't want to be among one of the commoners, I want to be one of the Hawariyun, the, the truly who purify themselves, then you hold nothing back. Then, then you exceed the 20%. You know, it is it, it, part of the seerah is the the Prophet ﷺ, when you study his seerah, when it came to his Hawariyun, his true disciples, he never prevented them from donating everything. When it came to less than the Hawariyun, when they would want to exceed the 20%, it's as if he's saying, I know you can't handle it. No, limit yourself. But the, the, the calamity is modern Muslims, especially Sunni Muslims, have somehow, while they have been taught to obsess over the minutia, and like Jews, exactly like the Jews, over ritual, you know, all the minutia of ritual, 
they turn sadaqa and zakah into one. So it, whenever the Quran talks about sadaqa, they read it in their mind as zakah. So they think that all they owe is this 2.5% on whatever they have saved for over a year or a year or more. No cause is victorious with such a minimal amount. No cause. Can you imagine two and a half percent to, to take care of all the Muslim refugees in the world, to educate all the Muslims who need education, to uphold, to respond to Islamophobia, to 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 gain power in the whole halls of Congress, to create think tanks that you know a think tank in Britain turned. British government decisively far more racist, but a well-funded think tank. Two and a half percent doesn't do any of that, any of that. But that's what Muslims do. It is, it is mind-boggling. It is absolutely, I mean, it, it, and that's precisely why anthropologists like Karen Leonard and others who studied Muslims in the West said that Muslims are the West are the least philanthropic minority. They, their wealth, in proportion to their wealth, they are the least philanthropic minority. The sort of stuff embarrasses us because it comes and says, all of you Muslims. Yeah, you love to talk about how this society, you know, non-Muslims are materialistic and capitalism and colonialism and ism and ism and ism, but you're hypocrites. You, all of these people that you condemn, they spend not just money on their causes, they spend money to hate your religion. They, they spend millions of dollars to attack your religion, not even to uphold their religion, not even just to spread their religion, to just malign your religion. And you are the most materialistic religious group on the face of the earth. And it's time that we confront that. We are the most materialistic religious group on the face of the earth. I was telling someone recently, when I joined UCLA, Hindu study, Indian studies, we had an Indian studies program, was not controlled by Hindu funds. During my, the time I started in the past 20 plus years that I've been at UCLA, I've seen Hindu families donate so much money to that program at UCLA that now Indian studies is completely controlled by Hindu nationalists. No one can be part, can be hired, can be even invited to give a lecture at UCLA that would speak positively about Muslims in Indian history because all the funding is by Hindus who want to support a narrative that everything Muslim in Indian history was evil. Pakistani studies, worthless. Not even on the map. Every, I mean, what are Jewish studies? Obviously, I don't even need to get into Jewish studies. You know, Jewish, Hebrew, Israeli studies. Yeah, we have three <laughs> programs: Jewish studies, Israeli studies, Hebrew studies. All extremely well funded. Persian studies. Oh, Persian studies. All the money that Persian studies got were from Persian Jews and anti-Muslim, anti-Islam Persians. So now. Persian studies at UCLA never talks about Persia after Islam. It's as if the only Persia that is real, according to the academic program, is Persia before Islam. This was wealthy Persians who donated a lot of money and made their preferences very clear. Islamic studies engaged the Muslim community in LA, which is an extremely rich in Orange County in LA. All they managed to raise 
all they managed to raise in 20 years, this is including me as the chair of that program for 10 years, is enough to have a conference, a symposium once a year. Not even chairs, not fellowships, not postdocs, just enough to have a worthless symposia where we invite a few professors and invite them and we can't fly them internationally because we don't have enough money for international flights. It has to be local in, within the U.S. No first class. It has to be economy. And a very modest honorarium. Very modest. So you can imagine how little the sum of money. Okay, you tell me. Do I need to say anything more? You just want to shoot yourself. You, you just, you know, you, you sit there and say, oh yeah, no wonder that, you know, I give these halakas on the Quran and hardly anyone listens to them. Who needs a Quran? You know, no, the Islam that we need is, is, is you know, hijab and nail polish and, you know, that's the Islam. You just want to shoot yourself. Okay, calm down, calm down. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> um, so the beginning it says that God loves the Um and I'm wondering why specifically. I mean, if the charge is for you know a broader commitment and standing shoulder to shoulder, was it because at that particular time one of the biggest challenges to Muslims was the, the sacrifice of actually engaging in battle and you know because it's, it's after Uhud I'm, I'm wondering kind of like what was going on yeah. specifically why this verb was chosen yeah that's a good question because can you repeat the question the, the question is why when it said that you stand shoulder to shoulder that it said you qatilun fight it used the word fight while you notice that later in the surah it says yujahidun fi sabilillah. They not fight but do jihad. And because the because as Rami alluded to in, in the even in the question itself, is that the biggest challenge at the time was that you are the the, the thing that people had the hardest these were not professional soldiers. These were not people who were drafted in the army and trained. These were Merchants. I mean, this is what some, yes, true that they bragged about their furusiya, their ability to ride, to ride a camel or ride a horse and hunt, you know, go after a fox. But even a lot of their hunting was done with the use of hawks. Like, you know, so you're not actually using arrows and spears, but you train a hawk to go after a... a... So when... The call, for the the the, the the thing that they had the hardest time with is if we go to battle, and you see this in, subhanAllah, I mean, when, when you start actually delving into the history, you see how, well, it, it, at that time, you know, battle meant you strike with swords and you strike with spears. So the likelihood that you're going to come back from battle was, you know, a major open wound that would be infected. The wounds are extremely painful. They didn't have painkillers. They didn't have... So the complaints, the anxieties to were very concrete. Well, you know, what if I get injured? And what if I get hurt and I'm paralyzed? What if I, they, they would worry about the amount of agony that being struck by a sword or hit by a spear or penetrated by an arrow. I mean, subhanAllah, it's, in, in, it's like as if the, the, the thing they, they if uh, there's poetry that says, you know, if I would, I fear not, um, how does it, how does it, that I fear not 
the, the, the strike of a sword that kills me, but I fear the strike of a sword that lays me in agony. On, on the, so, and that, that, uh, so that was the, the most immediate challenge is to, but while you're presented with that image, you qatilun fi sabilillah, as if they are a single solid row, that is then expanded later on in the same surah when Allah says, يُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ that, So it's as if it starts it starts with the, and this is, by the way, typical of the Quranic style. It starts by addressing the historical circumstance. But in the course of the surah, it generalizes the historical circumstance to the normative moral lesson. So it transcends the historical circumstance. This is why it's it, those who ignore the history are often doing something quite unfortunate with the tradition, because they 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 miss the the, the subtlety of the Quranic message, of how it the, it teaches you from the historical example, but it doesn't teach you so that you repeat history. It teaches you, teaches you so that you derive the moral lesson from the historical example. Thank you so much. Okay, this is um, part two of Enjim's question. Um, in regards to parakletos versus parakletas, can you please just reiterate the original Aramaic word that was warped in translation? Thank you. Yeah, it's mauhamama. Mauhama, it's spelled M U H. A W W A M A N A, Mau Hamana. Uh, ha Hamana, um, am I remembering this right? Yeah, it is Mau Hamana. Uh, that Hamana is Alhamd, is or Mahmud. Uh, Mau is always, it's a continuing verb the always praised or the always in a state of praise and which one paracletos or paracletas was the per paracletos what, is changed? what's in in the um gospel of john but it's supposed to be paracletas the the priest okay all right good okay um all right so next question is from reem um, you stated the opinion that Friday congregational prayer is obligatory for women. Um, I agree, but the vast majority would not. It seems that the basis of the opinion that women are exempt from Jummah is a hadith that alleges that the Prophet ﷺ said, Friday prayer with a congregation is a bi duty binding on every Muslim except for a slave, a woman, a child, yeah. or an ill person. Is it common that a clear obligation from the Quran would have exemptions created by hadith? Um, and then also, uh, I, was just, yeah. I apologize if this has been addressed before, but how would the Sheikh respond to claims that the Hadith above is authentic and creates a basis to exempt women from an obligation to attend Friday congregational prayers? Yeah. Um, uh, can Hadith create an exemption in the Quran? I mean, this is this is a huge usuli disagreement, uh, or, or usuli matter. Uh, usuli meaning in the, in, in the field of usul al-fiqh. Um, there are those who believe that a hadith ahad can create a hadith ahad means a hadith of singular of uh, the authenticity of this hadith is established to, through singular transmissions that it wasn't it wasn't heard by by many people and transmitted to many people, but it was heard by singular individuals who transmitted to singular individuals. And some schools believe that such hadith can create an exemption to the Quran. I don't follow that school. That a I look at the nature of the exemption. 
is it if the nature of the exemption is creates an issue in what we would call public law so in, in other words is creating an exemption that concerns Muslims in general all Muslim women and yet those who say they heard it from the Prophet are just a few individuals that doesn't make sense how the Prophet is going to come and say oh no don't understand the Quran this way but only informs just a few individuals and especially when these few individuals are not the are not like an Imam Ali for instance not the not normally people who would stand as deputies of the Prophet so this is very important that so this hadith which it, it is of an ahad nature but even more than that this hadith this ahad hadith is not just that it was of singular transmission but it is a hadith that has in all those who reported it has had problems in links meaning that in its chain of transmission someone who didn't meet someone else is in the chain of the transmission so someone who didn't for instance someone says I heard from X heard from Y but X and Y never overlapped geographically or chronologically so they might have actually never existed at the and so that chain that that problem in the chain is in all the different uh, you know either a, a chronology problem either a time problem uh, so on which so that's the other thing then add to this the fact that the practice of early Muslim is inconsistent with this hadith so when we look at the actual seerah we look at Ali al-Bayt and for me it is very important what Ali al-Bayt were doing because this is the family of the Prophet this is the ones who were very close and we see Hume constantly reports that the women of the family of the Prophet would go to Juma ah, would attend to Juma ah, and only stopped attending Juma ah when it, when it, the Amawids arose to power, the, the political motivation is clear that they are they they think they are, they have they're entitled for their place at Juma ah until the political system became hostile to them, and 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 I know exactly why they stopped attending Juma ah because once the Amawids came to power. They regularly cursed an Imam Ali in Jumas, and the the women of Ali Bayt will never attend Juma as Imam Ali is being cursed, and that was the law. That everywhere, everywhere, the Umayyads decreed that Imam Ali has to be cursed on Manabir. So that is another really important consideration for me. That so the, the now in addition to Ali Bayt, we also then have for. Um, in all the major cities, when we look at the, the the historical evidence of the architecture of mosques of built in Damascus, built in Baghdad, built in Egypt, uh, the, the major centers, that it was a regular thing in the first, at least the first three centuries, that it would. The, the the architects would take it as a matter of course to always create spaces for women mm. and spaces and so and it took a long time and I think it's clear when you find the 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 major transition the major transition was when the was the after the crusade invasions because crusades spread an enormous amount and the Mongol invasions and 
and as also um, the center of power moved from sort of the 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 inherited Islam that came from Medina to the Islam of Ottomans and various uh, various other ethnic groups that now were coming into Islam centuries later, and we see, you know, the, the a new conservatism about the role of women and so on. All of this, I mean, when I, I look at all the the, and then oh, and then when I look at something like Surah al Saf, and I see the importance of the idea of standing shoulder to shoulder, the idea that we we remind ourselves and affirm that we are all part of a an enterprise, a project. How can you accept women from that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it just doesn't make, it, this is not the Islam, the, the women were an integral part of the, the Islamic mission. And then the, the entire Islamic mission at the time of the Prophet and women played such a critical role. It, and, you know, all you have to do is just reading any book, uh, any of the sources on Sira, and you see the constant role that women played, which was very visible, very active. <clears throat> now, and finally, I am extremely suspicious of all traditions that knowing what how many uh, traditions directed at slaves um, ha uh, reflected the class bias against slaves treated slaves as less than human i am very suspicious of any tradition that that speaks about slaves and women, slaves, women, and dogs, women and donkeys, women and dogs in the same breath. Mm -hmm. um, they don't, they're not consistent with the character of the Prophet ﷺ. So for, you know, when you put all of that together, it leads me to the conclusion that no, th this is uh, probably misogyny, not God's will, but the will of misogynists. Thank you. I, I want to close with a question because I have noticed, you know, for example, Enja made a comment that she's currently battling with uh, Wahhabi attempts at her mosque to try and take over and impose this idea that, you know, women have to walk in a particular entrance or that should there be a partition between, you know, men and women. There was another comment that someone made yesterday at the khutbah that it's like the khutbah that they attended before the, the khutbah here was encouraging people to hurry up and go to Hajj because you might die at any moment. Um, you know, all of these things that are sort of like we know now we've been around, alhamdulillah, you know, uh, you and your <coughs> school of thought enough to understand that, you know, things have to conform to beauty and reason. And you the other day had said something about, you know, Usulis and how Usulis used to be the main school of thought before they were, you know, barred by the, the um, Egyptian, you know, uh, I'm forgetting the, the name. But anyway, I wanted to ask Uzzat this question. Yes. To please, I mean, I, I know um, a lot of people maybe feel like, oh, Usuli Institute, what's Usuli? Like it's something that we somehow invented on our own and that it doesn't have a history or a you know um, a claim to to our tradition and I just wanted to ask if you could please just elaborate on what you said the other day and help at least you know well, we may have other opportunities to talk about this but just to share with people especially you know people who want to go and fight these battles and say you know this is not just Khadr al saying something that's out there you know that's modern or whatever but this is actually there's a methodology here that we follow and that you know this is grounded in our tradition. If... Um, 
you were saying that the Sulis were like the, the foremost. No, I, I know the the <laughs> what the whole science of fiqh al-Islami. What a lot of Muslims just don't fiqh and usul al-fiqh and al-qawad al-fiqhiyya and the, the whole tradition of exploration of God's will at that results in what we call fiqh meaning what we call the understanding of God's will fiqh which of course means understanding that then we come we we we, we say to the to 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 you know غلبة to the, that it is probably the case that this is God's law as and and the fact then you have various opinions that compete that 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 about what God's law all of that is was the direct product of a dynamic that wedded reason and revelation kitab and hikmah and that there is a recent book that was published um, I forgot the name of the author but uh, by Brill uh, about the objectives of Islamic theology which also demonstrates the same dynamic in Islamic theology as it is in Islamic law the rejection of literalism the rejection of the possibility of law without rationality without the employing of rational analysis and reason as a an instrumentality for the search of the divine will all of the various methodologies for searching the divine will through revel through the 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 applying of reason to revelation is collectively collectively known as the usuli method the aberration was so called the ahl al hadith or what at one point even the hanbali school was started out as a, a, a strictly ahl al hadith school eventually abandoned its hostility to rational methodologies and the the golden age of the Hanbali school before the modern age the 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 golden age when you have people had like Najmuddin al-Tufi and Ibn Khudama even the Hanbali school integrated itself to usuli methods the Islam that allowed the preserved the methods of Islamic jurisprudence, the richness of Islamic jurisprudence that married Islamic jurisprudence to various mystical orientations, to various Sufi orientations, were the Usuli methods. The aberration to this were who were often even not even considered jurists in most of Islamic history, the muhaddithun, the Ahl al-Hadith people, who were fighting battles, you know, be, be, was between the Hanbalis and the Jariris in places like Naishapur and but but they were until the modern age, until the modern age, they were not a serious force in the heart of Islam but the Ahl al-Hadith were not yeah Hanbali Ahl al-Hadith reincarnated in its you again you, you read the debates between Wahhabi Hanbalis and traditional what I would call Usuli Hanbalis at the at the wake of the rise of Wahhabism when Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab's brother 
was debating with his brother about telling him your 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 you're effectively going against centuries of juristic thinking within the Hanbali school, which pushed Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab to call the vast majority of jurists, even within the Hanbali school, kuffar. That reincarnation of Ahl al-Hadith, which swept through Islam, is the aberration. That's what what I would what you were referring to is that there was in the 70s and 80s 70, uh, 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 we used to it used to be even even as late as the 60s and 70s and even early 80s that if you had a very good memory but you were not particularly intelligent you you studied in the ahl al hadith circles you, you memorized a lot of hadith but you couldn't comprehend or you weren't expected to be able to handle books on usul al fiqh books on qawaid al fiqhiyah books on tarjih these types of things were considered beyond your reach because they required analytical abilities not just good memories during the time that i lived through saudi arabia was giving wazarat al awqaf tons of money in egypt including the various wazara awqaf in egypt and unfortunately, part of that is that Wazat al-Awqaf became the most corrupt ministry of, in Egypt. But anyway, giving them tons of money to, in Azhar and the various other mosques under the control of Wazat al-Awqaf, to give a clear preference to the shiuch who, the, the Wahhabis at the time considered the real scholars and to eject the circles of learning in Azhar and in Hussein and in Masjid Omar ibn al-As or including for instance the firing which resulted in the firing of Sheikh Ghazali, Muhammad al-Ghazali. Sheikh Muhammad al-Ghazali was the Imam of Masjid Omar ibn al-As. He was fired because of pressure from the Wahhabis on Wazarat al-Awqaf. This, that's what I'm talking about. It was it it was a the Wahhabis, of course, because they knew that they were protected by Wazat al Aqaf, several times violently ejected our shiuch from from several mosques, including Abd ibn al As, where we were having. I mean, they also did to the Sufis, so it wasn't just the 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 you know the halakat that studying usul al fiqh by subki, um, uh, which they considered for whatever reason heretical, uh, but also the 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 Sufi circles. But so when we say usul these, because people have not you know when you say people have not read usul al fiqh by subki, so they they don't know the difference between usul al fiqh by Subki and, you know, a book by Ben Baz. The, the, the difference is enormous. The amount of just understanding of sheer logic. You, you, you have to, to have studied Montuk logic to understand Usul al Fiqh by Subki. But you don't need to study reason or anything else to comprehend the Lataymiyin or Bin Baz or, you know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I don't know why you got me on that topic, but whatever. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask because someone made the comment that, you know, they, when you think of a Suli, people think it's a Shi'i sect and it has no connection, you know. It, it, Just that, because they, is, again, you know, be, I told you why, because they, they again, it's, it, 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 it's just, Oh God, mother Muslims, because in, in, in because they probably read in some, in some superficial probably on the net 
that there was a, a, a battle between Usulis and Akhbaris in in the Shi'i tradition. Well, there was a battle between Usulis and Ahl Hadith in the Sunni tradition. And it is the same, the, the, if you look at the substance of the, of the, of the, the competition between the two, it was around the same intellectual issues. I mean, the, the, uh, the Usulis in the Shia tradition refused to call it Qiyas. The Sunnis would call it, instead of reason, they would call it Qiyas. But it is the same philosophical arguments. So what? I mean, it is, again, I wish people would stop going to Sheikh Google <laughs> and pick up a book. If they picked up a book instead of Sheikh Google, they would actually, their brain would start functioning. <laughs> uh, but that's, uh, everyone is going to Sheikh Google. It's just, uh, and Sheikh Google, as smart as he is, is not good for the, the health of Muslim intellects. The Prophet's pulpit is much better, so buy your copy if you haven't already. <laughs> Let's plug in. Okay, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you so much for this incredible surah. It just, again, keeps just getting better and better. Um, and we know we're in the home stretch, I guess. So, alhamdulillah, may Allah help us to, to learn what we need to learn and internalize what we need to internalize. Thank you so much. And inshallah, everybody have a wonderful week, and we'll hope to see you next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Good night.